Welcome to the Internet Report. I'm Angelique Medina, and I'm joined by my co-host, Archana Kesevam. Hey, guys. And we have a great guest for you today. I'm joined by Alan Malden. He comes to us from Telegeography. Hi. Happy to be here today. Alan is a research director there, so he's, uh, he manages uh, the ca- company's infrastructure research group, focusing primarily on cable, uh, submarine cables, terrestrial networks, international internet infrastructure, and bandwidth demand modeling. He also advises clients uh, with due diligence analysis, feasibility studies, and business plan development for projects around the world. And we're going to f- um, talk to him today about some of the recent articles and uh, research that he's done around submarine cable. So really excited about that. And in terms of uh, what we're going to cover today, so I'm going to go ahead and walk through with Archana some of the events that have happened last week out on the internet. So overall, it was a pretty quiet week, but we did see uh, a few blips, a few outages, and we'll walk through those uh, today. So Um, First thing, before we get into that, just a reminder to everyone to subscribe to the report. If you haven't already, we're on YouTube. We're also on pretty much every podcast platform that you can think of. So go ahead and do that so you can get updated when we put out new shows every week. And also just a reminder, we introduced this last week, but we have a virtual summit coming up on June 18th called The State of the Internet. We have a lot of great uh, speakers that are already lined up, including uh, David Belson of the Internet Society. We have um, uh, one of the researchers at uh, Virgin, uh, excuse me, Verizon uh, Media and on the content delivery network side, so the Edgecast side uh, of the business. And we also have um, really excited about is um, uh, Jeff Houston of APNIC. He's always a great speaker and he's going to do a talk looking at um, the future of the internet. So that's really something that um, you should tune in to watch. If you have an idea of something you'd like to see at the event or you want to submit a talk, um, you can uh, reach out to us at internetreport at thousandeyes.com. And also there's a little link here. You can go ahead and register. Registration is, is now open. So with that, um, let's just briefly touch on some of the um, overall kind of outage trends. So last week we saw a very slight increase from the previous week in terms of of outages across um, different provider types. So ISPs, uh, cloud service providers, UCAS providers, and so on. In terms of ISPs, just a very slight increase over the previous week. And overall, though, this is very much in keeping with some of the numbers that we saw previous to March. So these are kind of more norm um, levels that that we see. And of course, um, networks have, you know, service providers have outages all the time. Uh, Things break. Alan will talk a little bit about cable breaks. You know, this stuff just happens. Uh, So overall, you know, things are, are looking pretty good. Um, so some specifics on what went down. So um, we're going to look at a few instances. So this one happened last week um, on Wednesday. So this was May 20th. And this was a fairly large outage in Google's network. And it happened um, on the East Coast. So it was primarily in the New York area. And it impacted users connecting to Google services during that period. But it took place over an off-peak time. So this was, uh, let's see, this was around 3 a.m. Eastern uh, Eastern time. Yeah. And so the the patterns that you're starting to see here, you see the first spike, which is kind of the more interesting of the Hmm. few outages that in Google's network that you're seeing, this was probably the more impactful one just from the number of interfaces that were impacted here. But as you like expand that timeline, um, you start seeing you know, these smaller outages within Google. Again, um, these the, the interesting piece here is this was again off peak time, depending on where the outage was. Yeah. Right. Um, so this so, is, go ahead. 
Yeah, so so this took place in Hong Kong, this one um, here that was a little bit smaller. Right. And this was um, also at um, a time that was off peak for the local um, users. So in yeah. Hong Kong, so it's like 11.30 p.m. at night yeah. for Hong Kong. Well, not really. I mean, you know, you know if you're a uh, night owl, then, that's not off peak. But. <laughs> but the next one there, um, I think, I believe that was Moscow. And... Um, that was around uh, 5 p.m. PST, 3 a.m. Mm. Moscow time. So again, right. they're following that same trend of you yeah. know, an off-peak outage. Uh, probably the reason we didn't hear much about it in the news right. uh, was regionally, it was, it was really uh, an off-peak time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a that's a key thing because in some instances we'll see outages that are pretty widespread or big, but because of when they took place, and they just haven't reached, they haven't really impacted users, so there's not a lot of chatter about them. Um, so, uh, so that's good. Um, didn't seem to impact overall um, kind of user experience of Google services. Um, we also did see. A, an outage event that took place in the UK within um, one of the sort of, I guess, um, sister networks to Virgin Media. So their parent company, um, Liberty Global, has um, UPC, which is kind of more of their backbone um, uh, part of their network. And then they also have um, uh, Virgin Media. And this particular outage took place, I think it was like... This was also 19. around midnight. It was on the 19th here for us in the U.S. That's so the, the timeline that you see here is on a PST. Um, so mm-hmm. it was midnight, London's kind of same pattern, right? Like both these outages, yeah. Google that we just saw, and then the Virgin Media or the Liberty Global, uh, both around that off-peak uh, midnight time. Um, this one lasted almost five hours, though. Yeah. Yeah, again, I mean, it was, it was, um, it took place over a period that if it happened during the day for those local users would have um, probably, um, you know, there, there would have been more visibility on that. Um, right. But it was in the middle of the night. And you can see here, users from around the globe. So we have, um, you know, Europe, as well as um, India, even parts of the United States connecting across a variety of transit providers. So through Zeo, Tata, uh, Level 3, when they're um, entering the the backbone um, network, so UPC, there's there's an outage event, and that's impacting reachability of Virgin Media, um, uh, their network, and other services. So you know, again, um, it had it had a kind of variation in terms of the number of interfaces involved. So um, a little bit higher here, we still saw some outage activity during these uh, points here, so over multiple hours, um, and then had a big spike here, um, you know, still some uh, problems in their network during this period, and then um, this was kind of the final peak. Yeah. yeah. Some of the, um, this, as you guys, uh, if you've been hearing us for a while now, this is kind of the higher level, you know, uh, bird's eye view of internet health, yeah. right? This actually filters down into specific tests that are being monitored to specific services. And one of the services that we were monitoring, um, the 5R dip that we saw we, was from there, actually. We had 100% packet loss um, within Virgin Media's network, uh, lasted for about five hours, around the same time period. Um, so yeah, and... And one of the reasons why you'll see um, certain periods of the outage um, being surfaced here versus other times is to eliminate a lot of um, kind of just noise. You know, you may have instances in which just one, you know, interface on a router just has like a little blip and we're not going to surface that as an outage because there would just be too much of it. So there has to be a certain threshold that's met at a particular time through a particular network um, in order to, to kind of get surfaced here as an outage. So. All right. And then finally, there was a, um, a transit provider, in this case, uh, Hurricane Electric, that had um, pretty widespread um, kind of incident um, on Friday of last week. So this uh-huh. was the 22nd. So for kind of, you know, it's few it's Hurricane Electric. Yeah. They, oh, they had, you're going to see... Outages yeah, throughout. there's a little bit of, um, you know, kind of smaller scale stuff that you see here, but then you see like this 
prolonged period in which um, there's kind of varying degrees of effect in their network. So early in the um, in the incident, and kind of go here, we can we can look and um, see it's kind of you know we see some um, Midwest locations, Kansas, Omaha, Colorado. Um, if we go a little bit further along, um, we can kind of moves to the west coast a yeah. little bit. Well, here it's still kind of, you know, it's kind of moving. We see some West Coast as well. And at some points, it was really just, um, really at its peak, we just saw, for example, West Coast as well as Tokyo Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, as well. So it seemed to kind of throughout this event go between um, West Coast, where it mostly impacted um, uh, their network, and then... uh, uh, kind of Midwest and West Coast again, and also um, Tokyo at various points as well. So, and this impacted the reachability of like all kinds of services, Amazon, Microsoft, and others. Um, Hurricane so Electric is a pretty well connected, um, pretty big are. transit provider. So, um, anything like you know this prolonged outage that with this intensity is is bound to affect other services that you know pass through their network. Um, I think this was happening around. Um, in the morning, right? Uh, PDT. That's right. So it started around 5.50-ish mm. or so. Right. And I think uh, concluded around 7.50 a.m. I mean, that's that's definitely not off peak for, um, for that particular, for the West Coast. Yeah. So that would have been noticed um, if you had a provider you were connected to that also then peered with Hurricane Electric and your traffic um, transited through them, um, then, you know, there, there may have been some impact in, in terms of the reachability of some services. So, um, so that was the other major um, incident that we saw last week. Um, but, you know, again, these things happen. You know, we see major events happen throughout the year, regardless of other kind of externalities, other things that are happening in terms of users. Um, um, so this is still kind of in the range of normal. Mm-hmm. So with that, um, wanted to kind of uh, switch gears here and talk a little bit about some of the work that um, Alan's done at Telegeography. I mean, he's written uh, multiple articles recently talking about um, submarine cable trends, so specifically around um, the impact of COVID-19 on um, cable C um, operations and project rollouts. Um, but it's been, a, a, what was this? Was this back in March that you put that out? Yeah, it's about two months ago, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what's changed? Yeah, so whenever uh, the, the lockdowns first started happening and uh, there was concern about the ability for you know, cables to stay in service and cables to continue being deployed and, and um, up, upgraded throughout the world, and, and so how is it going to impact it? And so we wanted to look at these different areas and see what would the impact possibly be. So the real challenge was the travel restrictions and the quarantines, the ability to move people on and off ships, the, the challenges to keep them healthy on, on, on the ships. Also the challenges to have people in a factory working very closely together to make the cable, right? So there was a factory that did shut down, actually two factories that did shut down for about a, a month or so actually. It's now open again, though, which is good news. So there could, could be some small delays in cables that are going to be uh, you know, built and being deployed. There's also been some challenges with the installation in terms of uh, getting the permits needed to access um, the waters and the ports that you have to get to to put the cable into the water, right? So right. Um, those are, are being managed so far, as we understand it. Most of the challenges... Um, you know, it's been, it's been a lot of work among many different parties um, to make things uh, go, go smoothly. But so far, things have been going, I think, pretty well, as we understand it. Um, the other big issue is trying to maintain the cables, right? Mm. Uh, as I mentioned before, cables do break all the time. Uh, in average, there's about an average of one fault every three days somewhere in the world, right? Wow. It's not sharks. <laughs> That's a myth, as we all know, right? It's... Anchors, it's fishermen, it's, it's earthquakes, t- t- typhoons, things like this that are causing the damage to mm. cables. More um, than fat fingering, you mean? Pardon me? 
it's more than fat fingering um, and cre- creating an outage. It's actually natural. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's physical thing. It really physical damage. You know, yeah. Things are damaged yeah. in the yeah. cables. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but do we know that, um, so you mentioned some recent breaks, has there been, you know, any delay in, in fixing some of these breaks as a result of, you know, maybe more red tape or, or kind of process that's been slowed down? Well, we have, we have heard uh, from people in the industry who are involved in, in doing this. They've been able to perform repairs pretty well so far. Mm-hmm. They're able to keep the, the same crew on board. The crew has been safe. They don't have COVID. They're keeping them on the the ship is actually very safe for them if it's if it's a secure environment yeah. and they've been able to access the water where, where repairs have been required uh, there's been a few faults just in the past week that we can mention um there was a fault on, on the europe india gateway cable which was near the coast of um, morocco that was mm-hmm. on may 20th uh, it's been fixed now um um africa coast of europe I, um- not to interrupt, but what's kind of the average time frame to fix a cable fault like this, based on your Maybe experience? A few weeks, depending few on the weeks. type of uh, mm-hmm. ability to locate the fault, how, how severe the fault is, the weather, all mm. the things play, play a role in trying to get a cable repaired. So uh, during that time, sorry to interrupt again, it, what, what would be the impact on an average user? Yeah. Well, oftentimes, no, the user won't even know a difference at all. If, mm. if network a per provider has procured enough capacity on enough diverse paths, they can accommodate a failure. It could just be a small blip. In spots that I mentioned here, like the next two breaks I want to mention was one on the coast of Africa on the, the ACE cable. It's had four faults this year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, many countries have fewer cables on the west coast of Africa. Thus, the loss of one cable could have a more uh, mm-hmm. a greater impact on the user experience in those countries. Um, the AAG cable, which has been really fault prone, has had two faults in the past month. The fault mm-hmm. last week was off the coast of Vietnam. And so it, it, it won't be repaired until June 2nd, apparently. So that's a little bit longer to fix that one. But once mm-hmm. again, cables do break quite frequently. Right. And so having a, a lot of cables is important and putting capacity on many different paths is absolutely vital. And that's what everybody does. You can't just yeah. rely on one or two. You need you know, three, four, as many as you can right. get it. Right. right. So from a provisioning standpoint, as well as from a redundancy standpoint, that's sort of factored in as these projects are rolled out and, you know, like you want to have redundant cabling, you want to over provision. So you just have that buffer in place in, in case one of the cables is damaged in some fashion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that since cables uh, do break uh, often, uh, you know, the operators are, are quite, quite aware of what's going, what could happen and, and build an apps accordingly knowing that, that cables do tend to have, have, have faults. Mm. And, and Alan, you mentioned that COVID hasn't necessarily, like maybe it's, it's a small, small bit of a delay, right, in terms of maintenance. Uh, but you also mentioned that in terms of um, some of the new cable lines that, that were in progress, uh, it's still moving forward, maybe a little bit of delay. Is there anything that's significant there from a delay perspective and you think can actually impact um, the end user? If it didn't come up in the right time, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Right, right now is what we're seeing. That the, the, the delays are in terms of weeks and months. So far, it mm-hmm. seems like not in terms of a, of a, of a, of a whole a whole year. Mm-hmm. Um, cables are delayed oftentimes for other reasons. Getting the permits is a huge mm-hmm. problem, even without COVID. Right. Now with COVID and governments kind of shut down as well. Yeah, it's a big problem as well. Um, weather can be a problem as as, as well. But I, I think for the, the end user, it's important to realize that most of the cables that are currently in service, they have a lot of capacity that can still be activated and added out these, these, these new cables. So you're seeing upgrades still taking place. It's a little harder these days. You have to, you know, to, to get the equipment on site, to get people there to install the upgrades can be a challenge apparently. But, it's, but there's, there's still sufficient capacity that even if cables were, were, were delayed, uh, you know, over a year, it would still be mm-hmm. fine. Okay. On is, most, most, most parts of the world. Is there any, um, as you're talking about the permits and, you know, permits can always be delayed. Is there any kind of priority that's being given by governments now that the internet is, you know, kind of in the forefront, you know, in the backdrop of COVID being so critical? Is there any prioritization that's happening to, you know, give permits out faster in, at this time? Yeah, so, no. so the industry has done a lot of work, particularly the, the um, 
the uh, International Cable Protection Committee has issued a, a, a call to action, which is try to highlight to governments around the world that cables are a essential service, mm -hmm. that the workers who are working in them are essential employees. So I think that's apparently had an impact in helping to, to raise the, the, the profile of cables among governments around the world. Okay. And it sounds like in some of, in, in your recent article where you unpack this, um, you had mentioned the projects in question are, you know, th these are not things that are necessarily planned imminently. These are things that are going to be rolling out like maybe in a year or even more. So it sounds like the projects are um, kind of staged in such a way that there's actually quite a lot of buffer between now and when the, the completion date is for some of these cables to get rolled out. So there may be an opportunity to kind of make up if there are delays or if there's any issue. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, cables take a long time to, to build, uh, to, to do the, the planning, the surveying, the trying to build the cable, to deploy the cable. It's a long process. Um, so for example, just last week, there was a cable announced. It's called the Two Africa Project. It's a massive 37,000 kilometer cable that's going to go on both coasts of Africa to Europe and the, the, the Middle East as well. Um, this cable was announced, just as I said last week, it's going to be in service during 2023, 2024. Mm -hmm. So it's a long rollout period here. So there's plenty of, of time for these cables, these projects to um, adjust given the, the changes we're seeing uh, with, with COVID and other, other, other things that are slowing projects down potentially. Very interesting. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, one thing that we've also talked about is just in terms of the investors in, in these cable projects, right? I mean, carriers traditionally have been, you know, have in some cases formed alliances and rolled out these, um, these cables, but, but we're seeing, you know, and, and maybe kind of give us a sense of kind of the timelines here, but content providers have been much more actively involved in, you know, kind of sponsoring and rolling out these cable projects. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the biggest changes probably in the last 10, 10 years or so is the role of content providers. It's really Google, Facebook, and some degree Amazon and Microsoft mm -hmm. as well, who have taken the, 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 the decision to not just, uh, you know, buy capacity on the cables, but to actually be involved in building them and, and, and trying to join, a, join a, a, a consortium to build a cable or in the case of, of Google, build your own cable yourself. Mm -hmm. It started in, in 2010 when Google put a cable from Japan to the U.S. called Unity. And since then, you've, you've seen um, other companies get, get involved in this. And really, the focus is on the major transoceanic routes, Atlantic to Pacific, mm -hmm. also within Asia. Mm -hmm. So you primarily see it on the Pacific. It's the, um, you know, between the West Coast and Asia that you're, seen more of a focus for the content providers? Sure, it's primarily for the inter data center links has been the focus mm -hmm. of most of the building. Mm -hmm. But as, as, we, as we're seeing with the, the uh, two Africa cable, that involves Facebook. Also, mm -hmm. Equiano, it's a, it's a Google cable, also going along the coast of um, Africa as well. So mm -hmm. the, the investment is not just on these major routes, it's going to um, other areas as, as well. And it's growing very, very, very quickly. Alan, one of the questions, you know, as you're talking through these content providers, you know, investing in these cables, um, it, it, the question is, do they load share like a major um, cable link or are they making investments to have, you know, their private connectivity across, across um, data centers? So in terms of how they're building it, I mean, they, they want to have capacity on multiple different cables as well. And, and so they're, they're, the goal of the investment is really to Require a large amount of capacity, usually an entire fiber pair, mm. and how they and how they choose to use that is up, up, up to them. But um, a lot of the cables that are being built now in other parts of the world is because they can't get fiber pairs. There's not a, not free pairs on current cables, so build a new cable, you can get more more access to to, to pairs. Also, you know, newer newer cables can carry more pairs. More pairs leads to a lower unit cost. So it's really about trying to keep the cost down to boost the capacity as high as possible and also to go to certain spots where they want to go, which is where they have their data centers. Got it. Got it. Um, one of the trends that we've seen across, you know, uh, the big cloud providers, um, AWS, for instance, or, or Google, is this whole monetization of their backbone that they have kind of been um, pushing forward, like they have services that, you know, you obviously get a little bit more priority, 
um, and and it basically means you get better performance because you're using their backbone. Um, you know, so almost feels like all of the investments that they're making in in the submarine cables in terms of getting their back in you know infrastructure up and going, they have to monetize it some way. So it kind of makes sense that um, over time we're going to see more services um, that that you pay extra for um, using their backbone. Um, for better performance. Yeah. So, um, any any final thoughts on sort of the state of uh, submarine cables and operations, Alan? I think it's just uh, you know what we've seen the past two two months has just been really a a, a, a testament to how you know important mm. and reliable these cables are that are laying on the bottom of the ocean floor. You know that there there has not been any major outage or major problems caused by this global you know pan- pandemic. So. so I think that you know ultimately it's 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 been a test of, of of the industry and the industry so far has has risen to the to the, the, the challenge. So I think it's it's, a, it's it's an encouraging story ultimately and highlights the important role that cables uh, do do play for trying to connect all of us you know globally together. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, that's a great place to uh, conclude for today. So. Um, you know, Archana, why don't you share with uh, readers, or excuse me, listeners, um, <laughs> where they can get this free working from home t-shirt? Yeah, um, email us or leave a review and all of those, you know, podcast channels Angelique mentioned before, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, or um, email us with your address and size and we'll send your latest t-shirt in there. And with that, we'll close today's show and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye.